good morning. Good to see you all here on this fine Sunday morning. It's a little white out there, but good to see you all made it. Hopefully everybody's making their way in. Welcome to New Brunswick Church of Christ. It's like, kind of like we say, uh, snow can be a little treacherous, but it's kind of like uh, the good Lord gave us all a fresh start. The snow is pretty out there, and maybe as long as you don't have to drive in it, but it does look nice till we mess it up. So we appreciate that from him. Lots of things going on, but I guess I should see if we've got any visitors. I see Kevin's got some with him. Matt and his family is here. Any others we want to recognize? Don't want to leave anyone out. We're glad you're all here. There are several things going on, but the very first obvious thing is technical difficulties. So you're going to have to kind of wing it today. And uh, it's strongly suggested there's going to be a video, and it's going to be shown on there. So if you'd like to see it, you might want to move forward. I know that's a small miracle. Maybe that's a large miracle <laughs> for, for people to move forward, but that is strongly suggested. So if you would like to do that, that would be great. Um, lots of things going on. I'll try not to mess anything up here. Um, first thing, uh, after church today, there's going to be kind of a, Christmas take tear down. I guess that's a terrible way to say it. Undecorating, whatever the right word is. Um, they're going to be taking a lot of the Christmas decorations down afterwards. So anyone that could help, that would be greatly appreciated. And there will be a light lunch involved. So food seems to help. If you can stay and, and help out in that regard, it would be great. Um, also, there's another big box back there right next to the offering box. Because uh, what we're going to kind of try to do is, uh, I don't know if you'll call it a gift card shower for for the Schaefers, so if you would like to contribute to that, and we're talking gift cards for kind of anything, from a restaurant you think they should try to Titus Donuts, I don't know if they're Starbucks fans, you know, Walmart, that's always a good one, but if you would consider doing that in the next couple of weeks, we're still not sure officially when the, the welcome dinner is going to be based on their timeline and timetable and so forth, but we can start, you know, bringing uh, gift cards and so forth, put them in that box because eventually there's going to be a welcome home tree, I guess you could call it that, you know, one of the large Christmas trees that's going to be, and that's where all the cards and everything are going to end up. So if you would like to help out in that regard, there's a, a box back there. If you can drop those gift cards in there, that would be appreciated to kind of welcome them to New Brunswick. Um, mostly, I think that's it, unless I miss something. Anything we should suggest? Um, youth group is starting tonight. Sorry, I almost forgot that. I assume it still is even with the weather. I think the snow's kind of over, but still something to consider. But they are planning on starting youth group tonight. I believe that's it. Unless someone else has something. Brad? Prayers for Sylvia coming home from Sweden, so we'll remember her. And we have shifted to prayer time, and there's a lot of them to be mentioned. I don't know if there's some updates, but, you know, we're thinking of Pat Clark and Buck, Irene, uh, Nikki, Sean Brazil, Ron, uh, Elena's dad. Any uh, official updates you want to share this morning, good, bad, or otherwise? Uh-huh. Yeah, so that was related, giving an update on Sean being really dehydrated and her dad, kind of they're trying to find the fine line for him, but he's, you know, needing our prayers for sure and what all they're going through. And like I said, hopefully I think the good news, there's good news for Irene and for Pat getting a pacemaker and for, uh, for Buck. Who are you pointing at? Oh, yeah, sorry. And Kelly, you folks are taking a trip to Iowa. Is that correct this week? Leave it Thursday. 
and hope to come back on Friday for, for Kelly. She's going to see a, a specialist, I guess, regarding her vision, her eyes. So be praying for them and their travel. And I've heard that the weather might be interesting by about Thursday, too, if it holds true. So, Julie? Uh-huh. Pray for him. I'm sorry, what was his name again? Lane. Lane. Okay. Well, there's uh, a lot to pray for, so uh, we know that's powerful, and let's go to him right now. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for our many blessings, first and foremost, and for the opportunity and the freedom that we have to be here this morning. And thank you for everyone getting here safely. Pray they'll be able to return home the same. Many, many different people to lift up to you, Lord, this morning that we've heard mentioned from Hayden's friend uh, Lane to to the Mullins and Kelly and, and all the, the people from Ron Highsong and Sean Brazil that are having a real tough time, Lord, going through some unknown things. It's hard for them. It's hard for their families. But we trust you, Lord, to get us through and help us navigate those things. And there's others that hopefully are doing better, doing well, Buck and his recovery and and, uh, and Pat with her pacemaker and, and uh, Irene with hers and just a lot of others, Lord, that are, are thankful for answered prayer. And Again, we lift these up to you to know that you will see all of us through whatever comes our way. We just have to trust you. But we thank you for, again, the power of prayer, the fact that you hear our prayers and you answer them. Maybe not always in the way we would want or expect, but in your way that's best for us whether we know it or not. We pray for our service this morning where we know we're having some technical difficulties, but you're here with us, and we know we'll feel your spirit, and then everyone will be blessed, whatever comes our way. So guide us through this time and through the service, the communion time, and as Dwight shares your word with us, that we will all be receive a blessing for having been here this morning. Thank you again for Jesus and all that you do for us. In your name we pray. Good morning. Well, as Terry said, we are having technical difficulties, and you've probably noticed we have no screen on the back wall. So we're going to be doing some, some songs out of the hymn book, but we're going to do some songs that maybe you know, maybe you don't as well. If you really want to see the words, there are words on the back wall. You're welcome to turn and look at those. But this first song, I think you know. Um, God's first commandment to us was to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all of your mind. He is our hope and our strength, and we are to devote our lives to following him. Please stand as we sing. My life is in you, Lord. My strength is in you, Lord. My hope is in you, Lord, in you. My life is in you, Lord. My strength is in you, Lord. My hope is in you, Lord. In you, it's in you. I will praise you with all of my life. I will praise you with all of my strength. With all 
strength is in you, Lord. My hope is in you, Lord. In you, it's in you, in you. Turn to page 560 in your hymn books. We're going to be singing verses 1, 3, 4, and 5. For the beauty of the earth, for the glory of the skies, for the love which from our birth over and around us lies, Lord of all, to Thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For the joy of human love, brother, sister, parent, child, friends on earth and friends above, for all gentle thoughts and mild, Lord of all, to Thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For thy church that evermore lifteth holy hands above, offering up on every shore her pure sacrifice of love. Lord of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise for thyself best gift divine to the world so freely give for that great great love of thine peace on earth and joy in heaven lord of all to thee this our hymn of grateful praise. You can turn, uh, you may be seated. Turn to page um, 388. Today's sermon is a renewed love for my family. Deuteronomy 7, 9 tells us, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commands. This is verses one, two, and three. Earthly pleasures vainly call me, I would be like Jesus. Nothing worldly shall enthrall me, I would be like Jesus. Be like Jesus, this my song, in the home and in the throng. Be like Jesus all day long. I would be like Jesus. Broken every fetter, I would be like Jesus, that my soul may serve him better. I would be like Jesus, be like Jesus, this my song in the home and in throng. Be like Jesus all day long. I would be like Jesus. All the way from earth to glory, I would be like Jesus. Story, I would be 
like Jesus all day long. I would be like Jesus. Uh, the next will be hymn 185. You'll get the verses from there. The wonderful cross that bids me come and die to find that I may truly live. We sacrifice all to him because he has sacrificed all to us. Verses one, three, and four. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. See from his head his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown oh the wonderful cross oh the wonderful cross bids me come and die and find that i may truly live oh the wonderful cross oh the wonderful cross all who gather here by grace draw near and bless your name were the whole realm of nature mine that were an offering far too small love so amazing so divine demands my soul my life my all oh the wonderful cross oh the wonderful cross bids me come and die and find that i may truly live oh the here by grace draw near and bless your name bless your name it was a beautiful sight to wake up this morning and to look out the window and see the fresh snow Perhaps it's because I grew up in Florida uh, that uh, I still find uh, tremendous fascination when, when a there's a fresh snowfall. Um, I was actually 19 years old the first time I ever saw snow. Uh, I was in college, as a matter of fact. I was in Bible college and made that statement in the dorm that this is the first time I've ever seen snow. And of course, being you know Bible college, I was with upstanding young men, uh, so that had nothing to worry about until they uh, grabbed me and uh, I wasn't completely clothed and uh, drug me face outside and face down in the snow across the snow to celebrate the fact that I was seeing snow for the very first time. Uh, one of those fine young men uh, happened to be eventually a best man in. Dwight's uh, wedding, uh, so I'm not sure what kind of insight that gives us 
and to our new preacher. Uh, what I knew of snow before then was what I had seen on television and in pictures. And of course, the Christmas movies, the snow was always perfect and pure and white. And the roads are always clear. There is no mud, there's no splatter, there's no melting snow, there's no uh, dangerous driving. It's just all beautiful. The sleigh goes through the snow and hardly makes a mark. Uh, after I moved north, I found out that as pretty as the snow is, in a few days it's not so pretty. And it's muddy and splatters around and gets on your shoes and on your clothes and uh, makes your car filthy and makes you pretty dirty sometimes too. And removing snow and moving snow is all hard work. It's kind of like life. We are born in innocence. We are born pure. But life gets pretty muddy. And life gets pretty hard sometimes. And we get broken, and we get splattered, and we get stained. But we also get to come to this table where we celebrate a Savior who was also broken and muddied and stained, not by his own doing, but by ours. But by going to the cross, by making that sacrifice that we celebrate right now, we each can stand before God whiter than snow. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful that we celebrate forgiveness right now, that we celebrate everlasting life, that we celebrate the purity and the holiness that you, through your amazing grace, grant to each and every one of us who belong to you. Bless us as we partake and as we remember. In Jesus' name, amen.
we have a video that um, hopefully you're able to see and hear okay. We haven't test, had a chance to test it, so hopefully it all goes well. But uh, it goes very well with our sermon. I want you to listen very closely as you watch the video. Joshua 24, 15 says, Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So uh, the children are dismissed. Uh, you can go ahead and go to your class. You know, sometimes it doesn't matter how much planning you do. Uh, there's always an issue that comes your way. And uh, I just appreciate the effort. I, I really do. Uh, Nancy said that to me last night. And I said, boy, that looks good. Uh, that's worth the effort. Now, if you'd like to see the entire thing, it's on YouTube. Just uh, Google it. 
uh, you can find it. But uh, I ended up watching it two or three times, and uh, it was a real blessing. After the uh, dedication of his baby brother in church, it was a family uh, dedication, and uh, the family now was on their way home from worship, and little Johnny just sobbed all the way home in the back of the seat of the car. His father asked him three times what was wrong, and each time he said nothing. And finally, after several moments, the boy replied, that preacher said he wanted Frankie and me to be brought up in a Christian home, and I just want to keep living with you guys. <laughs> I don't know what comes to mind for you uh, when you hear the word home, but I'm sure for many of us, there's a variety of thoughts associated with it. Uh, some people think of that structure in which you reside. Uh, when you think of that place where you grew up. Uh, maybe that's what you think of when you think of home. Uh, Joe and I have always uh, enjoyed the fact of telling people that we grew up in Louisville and uh, Kentucky is uh, still home in so many respects, even though all of our parents are gone to heaven and uh, there's uh, just a very few family members uh, still there, but uh, in, in so many uh, regards, that's still home. Uh, some of you, when you talk about home, uh, you think about this land. America is your home. If you ever travel outside of America, then you find out just how uh, special America really is. If you go to places in Mexico or uh, Haiti or if you go to the Middle East, uh, places that I've uh, visited, there's no place like home. Or over the last couple of months, uh, I've said goodbye to uh, several friends. And uh, in three of those cases, when I went to the hospital to visit, and they had been suffering, one from uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, one from old age. And each visit, they just talked about wanting to go home. And they weren't talking about going to the address that they had there in Tennessee. They were talking about going to heaven. They were talking about going home and being with the ones who'd gone on before them and being with the Savior who had died for them. Regardless of what first comes to mind, anytime you hear uh, the word home, you, you have some special thoughts. Uh, in many respects, it's a, a beautiful word filled with, with meaning, uh, with sounds and, and smells and memories. It, it's a special thought process. Now, what I want to talk to you about this morning is a renewed devotion, a renewed love uh, for our family, and that is all wrapped up in home. Uh, if you have your Bibles, and I hope you bring them, Joshua 24 is the passage of Scripture that's already been referred to a couple of different times this morning. In Joshua 24, there's a familiar passage of Scripture, Joshua has led the Israelites out uh, of, uh, or to their new land, to their new home, and he's about to issue a challenge to them. And in Joshua 24, verse 14, it says, Now fear the Lord and serve him uh, with all faithfulness. Throw away the good uh, gods your forefathers worship beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Now, probably a lot of you grew up in a home like I did where uh, that scripture uh, decorated uh, your home. Uh, but this whole idea of what, what Joshua is talking about here, a little bit of background. The children of Israel 
had settled in their new homes, their, their new homeland. And under Joshua's leadership, they had taken possession of this territory promised to them by God himself. Now Joshua is now an old man. His days are coming to an end. And he sensed that with his death being near, that he had to do something. And so he gathered up all the people uh, of Israel. And they were over here by the tabernacle. And he challenged them one last time to serve the Lord with true devotion, to serve the Lord without reservation, to give him everything that they had to give. Now, I wonder what must have been going through the mind of Joshua at this moment. I wonder as he surveyed the cultural landscape, the one that they had just departed and now the one that they are just now in, I wonder what he thought of what was going on. Why was he, why was he like Moses before him, so adamant about the dangers of the false gods that they had left behind? As a matter of fact, in the verses that follow, look, look here, uh, we, we see that the people take exception to his reprimand. Uh, jump down there to verse 16. Uh, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve the other gods. Basically, the people are looking at Joshua and saying, wait a minute, what are you, what are you talking about? Uh, we wouldn't do something like that. And Joshua's reply it's almost like he's looking at them and he's saying, I know who I'm talking to. I know how you've been. I know who you are. He says, you are not able to serve the Lord. He is holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. And they, they shout back at him once again. No, this time we mean it. We, we really mean it. We're going to, to serve with everything that it is within us. He says, in, they say in verse 24, we will serve the Lord our God and we will obey him. But if you follow through, evidently the people present on that occasion, they did okay. That generation that had escaped the, the slavery of Egypt, they, they followed through with what they said. They, uh, they continued on. But the next generation did not they fell by the wayside and it was the fact that they hadn't done their due diligence with their family as a matter of fact if you go to judges chapter 2 in judges chapter 2 it, it says eventually that entire generation died and was buried then another generation grew up that didn't know anything of god or anything of the work that god had done for israel that, that generation, those kids, they did forsake the Lord, just as Joshua had feared. The promises that their parents had made meant nothing to them. And I, here's, where, here's where, as we used to say, this is where the rubber hits the road. The culture in which we live in today, it is becoming increasingly evident that we as a generation have not done our due diligence and so many in this generation that is coming up today no longer cares about the things that we once valued now, we have become so might i say lukewarm in so many respects that those who are coming behind us have lost their direction Attracted by a culture today of sexual promiscuity with no regard to gender. Uh, attracted by immoral pleasure. Attracted by material gain. They, they rush to embrace it as soon as they have the opportunity to do so. And they even welcome the opportunity to be a part of a culture that uh, do things that were, would have been completely unheard of 30 or 40 years ago. Innocent children abused, and even the, the situation with uh, uh, abortion. All the things that many of us grew up with, or, or many of you grew up with, uh, 
would have never been considered but now have become a reality. I wonder if he would have, uh, I wonder if Joshua would have been surprised at what he sees in our generation today. Now, I, I want to make sure that as we're becoming, as we're getting acquainted with one another, I, I, I told the folks in the interview process, I don't remember exactly how the question was worded, but I told them I've never worried about being politically correct because I think that our political system has really become a hindrance in the church doing what the church ought to be doing. I've always been more concerned about being completely correct scripturally, accurate with the Word of God. Uh, I, I never want to be accused of compromising the truth of God's Word in order to just make other people feel good. I, I think there's a problem uh, in our world when, we, when we're okay with sin, but we're not okay with being rebuked for it. I think that we need to listen to God's word, and, and if it makes us uncomfortable, we need to ask ourselves why. And, and instead of just jumping onto somebody for what they're saying or what they're teaching or, or, or what they're trying to encourage us to understand, uh, just be reminded that that's the word of God, and that is the truth by which we live. And, and it's by uh, the guideline that helps us to be closer drawn to him. We have witnessed things in our lifetime that are well beyond anything that many of us would have ever imagined. And I think it's time for, for many of us to do our best to turn the tide with those within our family and those within our church, our, those within our, our community. Uh, when it comes to some of the things that I've mentioned already, uh, so many churches have, have just gone along with the status quo. I counted over a dozen major denominations that either allow or give their blessing to same-sex marriage. And that was a question both the, the interview team and, and I had for each other. I wanted to know exactly where we stand. Uh, today, it, it's uh, different than anything that we could have ever imagined. Another similarity that Joshua dealt with, that we're dealing with, is this understanding of, uh, of being greedy and garnering for wealth and, and sometimes just delving into the pleasures of the world. Attempts to just continue to see what, how much we can attain and how much we can have and, and sock things away without ever giving credence to what we can do to share those blessings with others. For, for, de for decades, the d decreased value of human life is another cultural similarity. In the days of Joshua, uh, children were sacrificed because uh, of the idea of what the gods, how the gods would bless them. The pagans in Joshua's day practiced the barbaric killing of children for the sake of sex without guilt or materialism, uh, material consequence. And that's still the precedent of how abortion began in our world. In the past 50 years, on this date 50 years ago, over 63 million babies have been carried out the back doors of hospitals and clinics and thrown onto the, the trash heap. I, I did a little calculating. 63 million. I mean, that's just a, a number that we throw out there. But to put it into perspective, if you took the entire population of Texas and the entire population of New York and the entire population of Indiana and Kentucky, you still haven't added it up to 63 million. That's what's happened over the last five decades. And the battle continues. And, and it's over, even with the most recent ruling, the battle continues. All of these unrighteous actions and worse constitute the logical digression of individuals disobeying God's word and, and choosing their own selfish path. We've lost sight of the value God places on the family. 
The family unit is the focal point. That's where things begin, and it's the responsibility of people like you and me to see how our children are brought up and how they continue to pass on the legacy, how they continue to pass on the values that we hold dear. Are we driven by personal fulfillment that there's no practice too barbaric or, or horrible to be considered in the face of, of, of everything that Joshua was dealing with? He took people to task, and he said, maybe you're not ready, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, let me stop for just a moment. Some of you may be thinking, you know, we can't change everybody. And that's probably true. But if we start with our own home, and we start in our own family, and we start in our own church, and we start in our own community, one by one, we can make a difference. One by one, we just need to ask that question. What is it to me? As for me, what am I going to do? So here's my three thoughts. First of all, I think each of us need to evaluate our own purity. It's here in the scripture. Verse 23, Joshua, it says, Now then, Throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. Like, like the people of Israel, our greatest problem with purity is refusing to admit that we even have a problem. Where were the, their false idols? Well, if you read the book of Joshua, they were right there in their tents, within their family realm. And Joshua knew that their lack of total commitment to, to God was because they were so inundated with the idols of the world. And he says, throw the idols out, get rid of them, make, make yourselves pure. And so my question to you is very simple. What is it in your life that needs to be discarded? What is it that needs to be thrown out? What action, what habit, what sin that, ha that's, that has no place in the life of a follower of Jesus? The purity or the lack of purity is a personal decision. It's something that each one of us have to make up in our own mind and in our own heart. We either yield or we refuse to yield. There are, there are basically just two choices. To work with a purity of heart, to honor the Lord, and, and to serve Him with everything you have within you, or just to go ahead and be lukewarm and and follow the pattern of this world. Uh, you can't choose to just straddle the fence forever. Uh, you can't be just a little bit this way one day and a little bit this way the other. You can't look at certain details or certain circumstances and choose what it is that you want to do. You have to be transparent. You have to be consistent. And you have to be true in, in your devotion to him. If you're not, it's time to change. I have to be the, the same person no matter where I am or what I'm doing. I, I need to be the same person uh, whether I'm holding the remote control at home uh, or whether I'm holding a communion cup in worship. I, I need to be the same person whether I'm alone in a hotel room two or three hundred miles from home or at, I'm at home with my family. I need to be the same person whether I'm reading the scriptures or I'm at an airport sifting through the magazine rack that everybody else seems to be looking at. Or to put it in a real perspective from, from my standpoint, I need to be the same person when I'm standing in the only line available at Kroger because everybody is there because snow's coming and there's 20 people in line, and all I'm thinking about is getting back to the house and staying out of it, and then being the same person I am when I greet you on Sunday morning. Now, isn't it tough being kind to people in situations like that? Well, at least it was with three or four people there on Friday, because all they did was complain about what was going on. We'll either be pure or we'll be impure. We can't be both. 
depending on the circumstance or the situation. And it's up to me, it's up to our leaders to set the tone, to set the example. To the Corinthians, Paul wrote, Timothy will remind you of the way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. You don't just preach it and teach it, but you demonstrate it and exercise it day after day. Your purity comes from a heart that is sincere. The second thing, model vulnerability. Look what Joshua says in verse 15. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether you're the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Do you understand the, the implication? We serve an incredible God, and yet God makes himself vulnerable to us. God puts himself out there, and he says, here I am, will you love me? Every page in this book, God is putting himself out there. It's found throughout. He loves us. He just wants us to love him in return. And you know how tough that is? To put yourself out there to somebody else and be vulnerable that they might reciprocate that love? God told Moses in Deuteronomy 3, he, he said, What I wouldn't give if they always felt this way, continuing to revere me and always keep all my commands. They'd have a good life forever, they and their children. God was vulnerable. If they would only love me like this all the time, God makes himself the biggest target in the universe because that's what love does. He loves us, but he's not going to do something to make us love him in return. He's not going to make us love, us love him against our will. He will not use his power to force us to love him, but instead he gives us every opportunity to accept and return that love. That's what the cross is all about. The most powerful being in the whole universe makes himself available for us. The one who dwells in unapproachable light makes himself approachable. The God who possesses invulnerability makes himself vulnerable. God instructed Hosea, remember that? He instructed Hosea to marry an unfaithful prostitute. Do you ever wonder why? So that Hosea would know what it's like to be God. To know the hurt of loving and not being loved in return. To know rejection and humiliation and pain. God makes himself vulnerable so that we might choose to love him. And we need to learn from that example. I was visiting with somebody this week here in the office. And... Uh, we were just talking, and they were asking some things about me. And I said, Joe and I were married very young. Joe was 18. I was 19. She graduated from high school on Thursday. We had a rehearsal on Friday. We got married on Saturday. And then we moved to our first church the following Saturday. And we've been doing it ever since. Several years ago, I preached a series of messages on getting ready for marriage. And I made a statement, and I've made it a time or two afterwards, and it always irritates Joe, but she's not here, so I can go ahead and say it. I really didn't love her when we got married. I was just infatuated. Now, you know the difference, right? I mean, infatuation is... You're attracted to that person for certain characteristics. To me, she was young, and she was beautiful, and she had a certain amount of grace about her, and she had a beautiful voice, and the list was very long, and I was infatuated with all those characteristics, all those attributes. 
But as far as love, love is about compromise. Love is about faithfulness. Love is about caring more about her happiness than I do mine. And I'll let you in on a secret. The first couple of years, I wasn't more concerned about her happiness than I was mine. I was more concerned about my happiness. And I didn't understand why she couldn't be more concerned about my happiness. But as the years have gone by, that love has grown. Now, I'm still somewhat infatuated. I still think that she's beautiful. She's not young anymore, but I still think she's beautiful. I still love to hear her sing. I love to hear her teach. But more than anything else, I just, I just love her. Now, in those early years, I made myself vulnerable to see if that love would be returned. And that's what God has done. He has given everything up for people like you and me to see if we would return that love to him. And sometimes we miss that point. And that's what a covenant is all about. God didn't need to make a covenant, but he did. He said, if you will do this, then I will bless you with this. The question that all of us need to ask is, can I love my family? Can I love my church? Can I love my community the way that God has loved me? The last is this, practice accountability. It, it, look at the last part of this scripture. Verse 26, Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. Then he took a large stone and he set it up there under the oak near the holy place of the Lord. He said, see, he said to all the people, this stone will be a witness against us. It, is heard all, it has heard all the words the Lord has said to us, and it will be a witness against us, against you, if you are untrue to your God. Joshua makes a huge stone, and he places it within sight of the tabernacle where the people had gathered. And that's the purpose that you and I need to understand when it comes to a, a public decision. When we offer an invitation, when somebody comes forward for public repentance or public confession or public baptism, it's all about this reminder of this moment in our life that we wanted to be accountable to, to God for what he's done for us. Accountability to one another is a necessity when it comes to modeling Christ to those around us. Our accountability with one another is not just an issue, it's a lifestyle. And do you realize that God is actually accountable to us as well? How many times in Scripture does he say, trust me in this, test me in this? God is use, willing to use whatever means necessary, including doing something totally unnecessary just to prove his love to us. If God makes himself accountable, then we should too. I'm accountable to my wife. I'm accountable to my children. Now I'm accountable to my grandchildren. They're looking to me for examples. I'm accountable to the elders. I'm accountable to you. We're accountable to one another. I have an accountability partner, a preacher, that I confide in and he, he challenges me. I have close spiritual friends that remind me of my responsibilities and, and I'm accountable. You need somebody in your life like that as well. It's not always easy, but you need somebody who knows your weaknesses, somebody who knows your habits, somebody who, who knows your predisposition to, to certain sin and will love you and encourage you and help you along the way anyways. That accountability partner, a Christian friend who will help you keep your life on track, keep you going in the right direction. That's what I mean when 
I'm talking about a renewed devotion to the family. Purity, vulnerability, accountability. It's this idea of integrity. Being who you say you're going to be. Doing what you say you're going to do. It's the way we started out the new year. If the people who follow me imitated just me, would they fulfill the mission Christ has given us? That's what I'm hoping and praying and working toward for all of us in this new year. Before we have a song of invitation, let me pray with you. Father, we know that it's within, not within our grasp to, to change the whole world. But it is within our grasp to change our life and help others around us to change as well. And it's within our grasp to, to make, a, make a difference in this church and make the, a difference in this community and to be the people that would bring you the honor and glory that you deserve. So, Father, instill within us this desire to be pure, even like the snow that Tom talked about, to be vulnerable, to put ourselves out there, and to be accountable to one another, and most of all to you. Lord, we pray for your blessing because we want to make a difference. We want to be who you would have us to be. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. I still just getting to know who some of you are, but if there's anyone here this morning who has a public decision to make, we want to offer you that opportunity. Just step out, walk down front. We'll help you any way that we can. Come and fill our homes with your presence. You alone are worthy of our reverence. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. Lord, we vow to live holy, bowing our knees to you only. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me, my house. We will serve the Lord as for me and my house. We will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. Staying together, praying together, any storm we can weather. Trusting in God's word, we need each other, fathers and mothers, sisters and brothers, in harmony and love. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, we will serve the Lord, we will serve the Lord. Let's bow our heads for the benediction. Father in heaven, help us to take these words of yours today.
into our hearts. And may they shine out of our hearts as we leave here and live for you this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing it one more time. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. Have a blessed week.